You're listening to The Valley Current. Okay, Jared, let's do something interesting. I'm going to record this with your permission. I'm going to talk about the future of an entrepreneurial jazz playing barber and how he builds his practice. Sounds good to me. I mean, to me, you've got such a unique style. And right now you're doing, because we're still sort of at the edge of the end of the pandemic, you're doing mobile barbering which is a really smart way to keep your clients happy. And we're actually doing it outdoors with a great view of this fountain, right? Can right. you look at it? It's such a beautiful thing, right? The fountain looks amazing. Right, the fountain's amazing. Get the sun out, it's the right temperature, not too hot. It's a gorgeous day. So tell me how you got started in this because you're actually a professional musician and your studio, at some point we'll do a video, but your studio has jazz playing in the background. We're not doing that outdoors. And you play saxophone, right? Yes, I do. So tell, tell me, you were always a musician, weren't you? You grew up as a musician or in a musical family? Uh, yes, yes. I, uh, my parents, uh, my dad, he sang lead in the choir. My mom, she used to play the clarinet. Uh, my brother and sister are both artists as well. My brother is a sketch artist, uh, well, painting artist, you know, artist in general. My sister, she's a dancer. So. And aren't you a twin? Am I remembering this right? Oh yes, I'm a twin. You're a twin with a twin brother, right? Uh, twin sister. Twin sister. Okay. Twin sister, and so um, they they sprouted a lot before I did. So mm -hmm. I was. You know, watching them and just waiting my turn. Mm -hmm. And so now I have them. And um, I started playing the the drums at three. Started playing the piano at six, I believe. Were you self-taught or did you have a music teacher? Uh, I was self-taught in the beginning, and but I had music teachers all throughout school. Mm -hmm. um, piano teacher throughout my elementary education. Middle school, band director was great. Uh, that's when I started playing the sax. Mm -hmm. High school uh, just elevated my skill level because uh, the band directors I had were no nonsense, no, you know, low tolerance for uh, guys who didn't want to be there and who were not practicing their instruments. So. So diligence was important. Diligence, discipline, mm -hmm. tenacity, uh, consistency. All of those played a role in mm -hmm. how I played today. So you have some musical genes in you, but you also had discipline going for you. A lot of discipline. A lot of discipline. There's um, a guy that's written, written a book recently talking about what does it mean to talk about genius, including in music. And he said it's, you know, it's more than just genetics and it's more than just practice. It's a combination of both in a way that makes whoever is doing it feel excited about doing it, like feel a level of flow in doing it. But saxophone is hard, or is harder to play, isn't it, than, say, a piano? Uh, I would say yes and no. Um, for me, because I've practiced so long now, I'm saying it's a little easier than the keys. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the, the, the amount of air support that you have to have playing the sax makes it a little more difficult than striking the keys on the keyboard. Yeah, you have to be in good shape, don't you? You have to be in great shape. Because you got to have the capacity to keep blowing that horn. And it's not easy, right? Not easy. Which is why you see me making cameos at Yoga 6. Mm -hmm. Because with yoga, of course, you know, it helps with you know, controlling the breath. Mm -hmm. Definitely it's great cardio. When did you move over to the sax? Uh, I moved over to the sax 
at 13 in middle school. Okay. What was the instigator for that? Uh, so I didn't want to play the piano in middle school. I kind of was not a fan of the keyboard anymore when I got to middle school. I wanted mm -hmm. to do something cooler. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I thought was cool at the time. And so I saw the trumpet. I thought I want to play that because everybody else was playing it. Right. But then the sax made a special guest appearance. Shiny. Mm hmm. Uh, golden. Well, you had President um, Clinton playing the sax as a role model, right? Well, that came later, right? Right, that came later. I had no idea he even played the tone mm -hmm. until I got to college. Mm hmm. But it was shiny, and then I, I walked up to. Uh, one of the students and she told me I couldn't be in that line unless I played the sax. So I lied to her and I told her, yeah, I played. Huh. So you took a leap yeah. and said I could teach myself, I teach myself quickly, quickly enough. But I ran into another problem. Mm -hmm. The sax that she showed me was an alto sax. Mm -hmm. My dad and I went to the music store and brought the wrong mouthpiece. Oh, brother. And we brought a tenor sax mouthpiece instead of an alto. Mm -hmm. And that's why I play the tenor sax today. Wow. So one bad purchase or one good purchase, depending on your perspective, right? I think my dad knew what he was doing. Yeah, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. So did you have to buy a replacement instrument, or you could actually put that on that instrument? Well, luckily the band director had some tenor saxes in the back. So okay. That actually... Um, you know, made it easy. Made it easy and granted me the name Neat. Mm hmm Everyone else was playing the alto. I had the tenor. Right. See, a lot of people wouldn't even know that, that a saxophone has sort of a, a different mouthpiece depending on what you're playing. Right. Right? Is there a bass version, too? Oh, yeah. We got there a berry sax. Uh, we got soprano sax. Wow. So soprano, alto, tenor, very. Wow. So when you go see an orchestra, are all of them in an orchestra or, or just one type? Or what do you typically see like when you go to hear orchestra music? Uh, usually you'll see the uh, the alto sax. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see the very sax in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see the tenor, especially the soprano, because the soprano kind of mimics the violin. Mm -hmm. Clarinet as well, but really meant the violin. Do you think these four different types existed, say, like at the time of Mozart or Beethoven? Does it go back that far? Actually, or was the horn more generic back then? I had to see when Adolf Sax created the saxophone. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he was around when Mozart was around. Mm -hmm. But if he was, I mean, the saxophone, I think just not too long ago was introduced to the orchestra. Okay. So even in high school, uh, we didn't have any saxes in the orchestra. They're probably more expensive. They're probably considered more expensive instruments than say like trumpets are, right? With a lot more metal to bend, a lot more keys to put on it. Well, I think just for, I think the sound that they were going for back in the day didn't include the sax. Mm -hmm. They're relatively around the same price for the pros. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I think it was the sound that they were, they were going for. So when did you feel like you had mastered it, given that you started on this sort of dare at the age of 13? Uh, I felt like I was getting pretty good um, at 14. That's fast. Yeah, I felt like I was getting pretty good. Uh, I was playing in my church choir, and uh, our music director, Terrence Clayton, he would feed me the notes. Mm -hmm. He would start singing and keep feeding the notes, mm -hmm. you, know, what, you know, kind of show me what to play. Mm -hmm. And then, not too long after, I started developing my own ear. I had another uh, sax influencer by the name of Steve Williams. He played the sax. Actually, he was the first professional sax player I had ever seen. Mm. I started playing the sax, and um, at 13, you know, we 
go to church and there was another sax player there. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot more talented than I was. And it was Mr. Steve. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Is that coincidence? Coincidence. Wow, what a coincidence. Did he become your mentor? Yes, he did. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's really beautiful. So you've been playing the saxophone for like over 20 years then, right? Right. And now you're playing at the Hard Rock Cafe in Tampa yeah. on Friday? On Friday. Wow, that's big. And you got a group, right? A jazz group? I do have a jazz group, but uh, this time I'll be, it'll just be me and either a bass player or a keyboard. Wow, nice. Well, so what are you calling the group? We don't have a name yet. Okay. Yeah, but the, my my group we're usually called the Groove. The Groove. And you got some CDs, or are you on whatever these music channels are, Spotify and the rest? Uh, I am on uh, Apple Music. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I've done a few collaborations with other artists, mm -hmm. uh, but my solo album has not come out yet. Mm -hmm. So will they let you record on the stage there, like live at the Hard Rock? Will they let you record so you could get published on these uh, digital channels, or does the Hard Rock forbid that? Um, I, I believe that they do forbid uh, any type of live recording, but mm -hmm. then again, um, the, at the volume that you know, we play it mm -hmm. in the restaurant. Yeah, I mean, I guess we could record it, but it wouldn't be... Wouldn't be the same quality. Right. Right. Yeah. So do you still listen to long playing albums, LPs? Do you have any vinyls? Uh, or are you, or do you, you're more digital these days? Oh, yes, I have some vinyl records. I got Marvin Gaye. I got, uh... Al Green, I have uh, uh, Junior Walker. Nice. Uh, you name it, Bob Marley. Beautiful. So I got a gift for you that I'll bring from California. I've got a client that's come out with a new turntable and he thinks there's gonna be a resurrection of vinyls and he thinks that turntables can be innovated. And he's come out with one where you see all the parts through um, the plastic case. It's like an open plastic case. So you see all the motors and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Better than me and Martha. Yeah, that's the last outdoor barbering that I've had. Last outdoor haircut was in overseas in Myanmar. I think it was only what? Like the equivalent of 50 cents or something? And Myanmar dollars. That was pretty good. So how'd you go from music to becoming a additionally a barber? How did that happen? Um, in middle school, uh, there was another cat uh, that I looked up to. Mm -hmm. He wasn't quite a barber, but his brother was. But right. his story is. His brother put his hair every week. Wow. And so, as a result, he had more success getting the ladies than I did. Ah. <laughs> and that was a problem for me. Ah. So he said, look, you really need to get really good about taking care of your personal hygiene and get yourself a haircut every week. You know, we know some friends that literally do a haircut once a week. I think, I think I'm lucky if I do it once every other month. That's the last haircut was when I was up in your studio. Right. Right. That was probably a couple of months ago. I bet that was a couple of months ago. We're in October. I think it was August. Might have been just the beginning of September. Yes, it, it was kind of a. A catalyst, to be honest with you. I mean, he 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 didn't say anything as as far as I me mean, uh, keeping up my hygiene. But I thought to myself, okay, if he has a haircut every week, I only get a haircut every two weeks. Mm -hmm. He has a better chance than me. Yeah. So let me even the the, uh, 
the board here and uh, ask my parents to buy me an edger. Oh, and you started doing your own self haircut? Yeah, I started edging myself up. Wow. You know, messing myself up. I bet. A lot of trial and error. Oh, man. And then uh, it really didn't start till I got to college. Uh huh. I took my dad's clippers with me. Uh huh. And uh, started cutting my own hair. Cut myself bald the first time. Ouch, ouch. Yeah, that was an accident. A couple students were asking me if I was cutting hair. They saw my clipper book. Well, my clipper bag at the time was a uh, bag, a toiletry bag from Samsonite. Yeah. Now you got a whole setup here that's pretty magical. I love it. Mm -hmm. So you started doing it in college to both, you know, take care of yourself and as well as to make a few bucks between music gigs. Right. And what was that in Miami? Where was college for you? Uh, actually, right here, right here, South Florida. Okay. Because you grew up in Miami, didn't you? Yes, I grew up in Miami, right. Florida. But that's why you were at the game yesterday, because Buccaneers were Miami were, were against the Buccaneers. Right. Yeah, I kind of thought Dan Marino was going to come out there and give us a hand, but mm -hmm. he didn't show up. So. Mm -hmm. We lost. It looked like the first quarter was going to be a close game, but then things just broke apart, I guess. Yeah. Buccaneers won by like 20, didn't they? 20 points. It was like yeah. 42 to 17? Yeah, 45, I think. 45. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they took, uh, they took Brady out in the last quarter and put in the guy that wears number 11. What's his name? Gruber or Bra Brabber or something? A different younger quarterback? Yeah, I remember he almost fumbled the ball. He did fumble the ball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how hard is it to get a gig at the Hard Rock? That's like the big, big place here in Tampa, isn't it? Right. That must be hard to do. Do you have an agent that does that for you, or how do you get that done? So, a um, couple things. I actually started playing Hard Rock my last... I mean, last year of college, mm -hmm. I was just on with another group, you know, playing with them, and, and I got offered another gig there, uh, post-graduation, and uh, there, uh, another guy named Dennis Bailey, he has an entertainment company, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was on for, I was subbing for a gig for the Tampa Bay River Fest, mm -hmm. and he heard me there, mm -hmm. and called me up one day and said, Jared, I'd like to put some money in your pocket. Nice. All right, well, where's the venue? Mm-hmm. Show me the hard rock. Wow. Yeah, man. You'll That's the your own shows. big break, huh? Yeah, huge. That place is busy. We've been there on a weekend. I'll tell you, the parking lot, parking structure gets over full, and that place is busy. Even even during what might be called the pandemic, it seemed like they put a lot of plexiglass up there and they kept the crowds going. I guess people like to gamble, huh? Yeah, I mean, even if it's gambling with the COVID. Right. Yeah, they'll do it. People will do it. <laughs> I mean, I was surprised. They let you touch the cards and everything. I was like, wow, you're letting people touch the cards? They're like, yeah. And, and you know it, it's it's a little surreal in a way because people are wearing masks some people aren't wearing masks but it's a big business and hard rock is probably loves the fact that they get gamblers to come in and go to the restaurants and sometimes they get the music right out there kind of right out in the middle of the, of the floor right they got like a whole separate uh, bandstand there right and they've got all the costumes of the different performers. It must be really valuable. Well, I bet all the poker players are wearing their masks. Yeah, that's what I would think. You know, there was something published, I think, this week in Time magazine, the 100 most popular songs of the last 100 years. 
which was kind of interesting. Number one was uh, Aretha Franklin, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Respect. Right. That was like number one, I guess, under the pop pop chart. And maybe it was the last 50 years. Have you seen the uh, movie reenacted by Jennifer Hudson? No. I haven't You're seen good? it either. I haven't seen it either. I did see the other one. I think the the uh, actress's name, but it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about it. Mm-hmm. So who who were your favorite artists as you were growing up as a teenager? Like besides the, the person who became your mentor on the sax, who, who else would you listen to? Were you t oriented towards jazz back then? Oh, yes. Uh, my parents played a lot of old school mm -hmm. jazz and R&B. Mm -hmm. uh, the jazz artist I gravitated to, though, was Joe Henderson. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Joe because uh, he, he sounded very weird. Uh, you know, it's very unique as well. Mm -hmm. He didn't sound like the other sax players. Right. Um, he used a lot of a lot of different tension notes. Um, I'd say he's incomparable, actually. I, I don't know who I would compare him to. Was he an alto, or was he a tenor, or what was his jazz? Uh, he's a tenor player. Tenor, okay. Yeah, tenor player. One of the best to do it. Are you creating music as well? Are you creating songs or lyrics or music or anything? Yes, creating music, uh, songs, lyrics. Uh. So how does that process go for you? Like, what, what, what do you find inspires it? What, what has you sit down to start writing down notes? Or how do you do it? So what inspires me, uh, I'll is the piano. I'll, I'll sit at the piano. Mm -hmm. I'll play a few different sounds on it, mm -hmm. different chords. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that sounds weird. Mm -hmm. Let's play something over it. And will you have a tape recorder going, or will you just be making a mental note of it? Well, a lot of the times I'll have my phone recording it, mm -hmm. or I'll record it in my, uh, at, back then I was using GarageBand. Right. Now I'm on. I've upgraded to uh, Logic. Is that an Apple product or what is that? Apple product. Yeah, Logic, L-O-G-I-C. Right. Is it just sound or is it video too? Uh, just sound. Uh, mm -hmm. They have different, um, especially on the keyboard, if you connect it to what they call a uh, MIDI, mm -hmm. uh, you, you'll be able to access all the sounds GarageBand or Logic has. Wow. Nice. And does that work on your phone as well, or does that just work on an Apple computer? Uh, it works on an iPad. iPad, okay. The phone, they haven't gotten there. Just, I mean, they do have GarageBand on the phones, mm -hmm. but uh, for me, they haven't, uh, they need to advance it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been on tour as well, so being out on a ship, looking at the water all day, can inspire you as well. Mm -hmm. And then, waking up in different places, you know, some of those places I see on a postcard, mm -hmm. but seeing it live in front of you, it's right. definitely inspiring as well. Right. Well, there must be some advantage that you have in the dexterity of manipulating keys, whether on a piano or a saxophone, and the dexterity that you have as a barber. There must be something there. Although I have to say, I think you're the first person I've ever met that has one leg in each of those professions. I think you're unique in that sense, Jared. Unless you tell me, no, there's other people just like me. <laughs> I don't think so, right? Well, uh, there are other barbers who play, uh, but I must say, I always say, I'm the only one with my fingerprint. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, 
I love it. I uh, I treat them. I treat them both the same. You know, they're just art. It, it, I'm I'm creating. Uh, when I'm playing music, the ear of mm -hmm. the audience is my canvas. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I'm cutting hair, your head is my canvas. Right. But also, your ear could be my canvas as well. That's why I play the music in the background. Right. 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 Barbering the music here like a good wine and a steak. That's what I think. But, you know, if you look at these franchises like Supercuts and there's another one I think called Sports Cuts. They try to put a lot of television with a lot of, like, sports playing or sort of like creating a more of a bar-like atmosphere, like a sports bar. And I don't think that's as unique as playing the right music while someone's getting a haircut. I think it's, um, maybe it's just the modern approach. I don't know, people want to be more visual. But I think your approach with audio is a much smarter approach. Maybe it's more, it's more classical in that sense. Have you ever been to one of these super sort of fast in, fast out kind of places? just to experience it? Well, I've been to, to kind of check out the competition. But right. I've never been to get a service. Oh, you never been there to actually get your hair cut or your beard Trim. groomed or trimmed? No, uh, I, to be honest, uh, the, because they, I mean, so I tried to actually work on one of those mm -hmm. and they rush you. They want you to rush a job, right? They want you to rush job, mm -hmm. and also you can't really bring your own clippers in there. Oh, really? They have a, uh, a set, uh, you know, unless they change some things, but they they have a set clipper that they want you to use. Oh, they sell you that? They sell you their clipper, or that that's just their property that you're working with? Right. I I think it's just their property that you're working with. Interesting. I didn't know that. So, I mean, when you're dealing with artists and you tell them what paintbrush to use, yeah, I think you limit them. That's a non-starter for most artists, right? Right. Most artists are really sensitive about their art. Right. And about their equipment. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they've sort of brought this whole time motion study to the way in which to maximize profits in a strip mall kind of setting right so they try to like schedule you and you have an app for scheduling and sort of like you're not in the waiting room that long and then they kind of it seems like it's a much faster uh, approach but it's a different relationship with your you have no relationship because usually it's a very anonymous new person right right it's sort of like uh, robotic almost Right. Historically, I think the barbers were sort of like the medicine, med, you know, quasi-medicinal people of the past who used to remove, um, you know, boils and that sort of thing. They actually did quasi-nurse kind of care. Right. Right. I heard a lot of barbers right. used to be, well, they doubled as dentists and right. doctors. Right. Right. I mean, it was sort of like the place someone would go if they couldn't figure out, well, what's this all about? You know, what's that all about? And barbers were originally or called tensorial artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, just cutting with knife planes. And now we moved all the way up to electric well, wireless electrical clippers. Right. I mean, what do you think is happening to the profession as a whole? Do you think it's sort of going the way of a lot of other professions where people are like doing their own stuff and you know, people are selling their own houses now, they don't even use real estate brokers and people are doing it yourself law, they do their own lawyering. You know, a lot of do-it-yourself stuff is happening with the internet. What do you think is happening in the whole area of haircutting? Because I had a couple of people recently at my office say, oh yeah, my wife cuts my hair for me. You know, she does an okay job. She learned on YouTube. You know, I don't know that you can learn how to cut hair on YouTube, but 
they don't really even want to go out to a barber. You know, they want to like travel out of their home during the pandemic. I think the pandemic birthed a lot of uh, new barbers and stylists. Right, <laughs> who aren't really licensed. Right. Because a licensed profession. Right. You're one of the few that'll also give, give a shave. So, you know, people trust you with a sharp object. Right. All right. And so, um, I mean, I've learned a couple of things off of you, too. Yeah. Um, but I've already learned it while I was at school. It was just kind of like a refresher. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre uh, going to school, uh, before I went, um, you know, I learned some different designs off of YouTube or mm -hmm. just looking at a picture. Mm -hmm. I would learn. But I just had the knack for it. Not that they don't. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, some, some people probably discover that, oh man, I actually can do this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as a profession as a whole, I, I don't think barbering is quite going anywhere just yet. Um, it's here to stay. It's here to stay. Okay. Now, I will say, uh, you know, a lot of barbers are getting hip now because, uh, you know, stylists, they charge a certain fee, you know, to style the hair or to color the hair. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like $100, $200 at most, maybe even $300. I know a woman that travels to Chicago every six weeks to get her hair colored and, and clipped and styled. She's, she's got, and she goes from California to Chicago, because her hometown is Chicago. She's had a 30-year relationship with her hairstylist and colorist, and she ain't gonna change that, she tells me. So she'll fly to Chicago. I mean, she still has family in Chicago, too, but the true principal purpose, she has told me, is to get her hair colored and styled, and she claims she can't find anyone in California that can do the same thing that this gentleman does for her in Chicago. I mean, that's pretty amazing. If you say the trip costs her even with advanced tickets, 600, 700 bucks round trip. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty pricey approach, but she trusts no one else. And there are some really funny stories like that that you hear about how people have like, gotten really offended if someone new has given them a bad bad haircut. I mean, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I'm sure you haven't. But people get pretty sensitive about their looks and their hair and whether they feel that someone's kind of done something that's injurious, whether negligently or inadvertently or otherwise. Wow. And there's really funny stories like that. I've actually had that experience. Really? I, I've gone to a, a new barber while on tour. For yourself? For myself. And, you know, just wanting to mm -hmm. have a break at least. Right. My arm right. Here. right. And, uh, I mean, he didn't quite butcher me, but it wasn't a great job. I looked in the mirror. And you were I, like, whoa, what happened here? Yeah, it's like, did you cut my hair? What or? did he say? That would be $25. <laughs> <laughs> What's he drunk? Or, I mean, there must be some bad days that barbers have as well, right? Barbers do have bad days. Right? I have bad days as well. Right. I mean, you want to catch someone on a good day, right? It's like it's like surgery. You don't want the surgeon to have come off of a bad evening, big fight with his spouse or, or her spouse or something, right? Right, right. But, you know, then again, I this... Cat in particular, I think that was one of his good days. Really? Yeah, he smiled at me and gave me the mirror. Wow. I think he thought he did a good job. Wow. But, wow. you know, me being a barber, and I didn't tell him I was a barber. Yeah. I was there kind of undercover just to see, you know, how he did. What his style was. Yeah. yeah. Did you dislike his style instantly from the start, or did he have a good start? Uh, honestly, I was... Uh, his start was okay. I mean, he told me he was the barber. He, well, he used to be the barber for uh, the Seattle Sonics. Okay. And um, one guy in particular he cut was uh, Gary, uh, uh, what's Gary's last name? Oh my goodness. Who's the basketball player, Basketball right? player. Yeah. He used to play for the Sonics. Okay. But, you know, I didn't realize until I got out of the chair that Gary, 
is bald now. Oh, brother. And he was bald back then. Wow. So he just shaved him. I he, just shaved him. Yeah, he either gave him a bad haircut and he told him to cut it off. Yeah. Or uh, he was just bald. Right. So, right. Either way, he didn't have a fade like me. Right. And I could tell mm -hmm. maybe his fade game was not up to par. Or just wasn't what I preferred. Or maybe I'm being a little too hard on him because I'm a barber as well. Right. What do you think the career work span of a barber is these days? Like if you become a barber at the age of say 25, do you think most barbers stay in practice for like 50 years until like 75 or is it more longer or shorter? Or what do you think it's like? I think it's shorter. Shorter. Think, um, <clears throat> most barbers who <clears throat> have the uh, mentality of, you know, kind of teaching mm -hmm. and or uh, retiring early, mm -hmm. uh, they do that. They, they either get uh, a a barber shop full of other barbers. Ah, okay. Yeah. Because right. they got the infrastructure. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And have them pay their bills for their, right. their life. Right. Or they build a school and have that pay the rest of the bills and they just go in and teach them. Oh, interesting. Do you need a special license to teach when you teach or is it just your barber license allows that? Uh, your barber license allows that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, more so if you've been practicing for you know a number of years. Mm -hmm. Your experience will allow you to well mm -hmm. and your work. Because mm -hmm. some barbers are experienced, but their work is terrible. Right. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, I think along with your experience and your work and your ability to instruct, mm -hmm. you'll be able to you know, mm -hmm. be a barber instructor. Mm -hmm. I recently, uh, well, maybe in the last two years, no, sorry, three years ago, I applied to be a barber instructor. Okay. I had the skill set, mm -hmm. I had the experience, but... You were too young. Right. They looked at you and said, you gotta get some gray hair, my man. Right. No, I can believe that. Look, age discrimination works both ways. It does. You know? And then you'll find if you wait too long to reapply, well, you're too old. You're like, you got to be like right in that sweet spot, just a few gray hairs, but enough. Enough. Enough, right. It's interesting. I mean, it's an interesting problem in a way. How does it work for you? I mean, you recently just uh, passed the bar? Yeah, I passed the, I passed the Florida bar. In fact, I'm getting sworn in the day after tomorrow. Wow. Yeah, I, we were gonna drive to Tallahassee, but then I have a conflict with another client. So they're doing by Zoom virtual swear-ins. You know, they offer to do it at the Florida Supreme Court, right in the courthouse in Tallahassee, but that's like a four hour drive. And then we were looking at the flights, but by the time you get on a flight and you get off the flight and you rent a car, I mean, you're gonna kill three hours getting there. You know, you gotta get to the airport an hour ahead of time, at least these days. Yeah, you do. You know, it's, a, you know it's, it's like going to Los Angeles from San Francisco. It's always six of one, half a dozen of another. And I know people that can drive from San Francisco to Los Angeles typically leaving like at two in the morning that can do it in like less than four hours of drive time and it's it's like 360 miles or something i mean they they average like 95 miles an hour wow yeah they they really roar i, I mean i think it's dangerous but they do it you know that interstate highway i-5 is like mostly trucks but then there are these guys in Porsches and Maseratis that treat it like the Autobahn. I'm sure something like that must exist in going to Tallahassee from here. There's a drive from here to Tallahassee. Yeah. It's not too bad. Yeah. Uh, You've done it. I've done it. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, I say if you know if that highway was I four, then we have a problem. Yeah. There's something about those eyes mm -hmm. that creates huge problems with traffic and right. getting right. somewhere on time. Right. Even if you leave early. Right. Yeah, it was a big milestone because I think I was the oldest applicant in Florida. I think a lot of people are like, what? Do you want to take the Florida bar exam? I don't think they want older people to take it. I think their attitude is like, hey, we want Jews for the longest period of time. You might not stay alive long enough. I think that's their attitude. Well, with this pandemic, nobody knows anything. You right. Know. Yeah, so it's a crapshoot. Yeah. A total crapshoot. So, were you worried about being in a crowd? Because you were at the Buccaneers Stadium and they, they didn't have a full house, but they, they had a lot of people there. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. More. I mean, I was kind of amazed because it was the first time that we ever went to that Raymond James Stadium. And man, it's like Party Central walking from your car or from you know street parking in, on someone's lawn, because that's what they do in that neighborhood. They right. do a bunch of street parking. And you walk in and like selling beer and selling soda and so it's like a it's like a block party going on. It is. It's pretty amazing. And then there are all these people that are like tailgating. And they don't have tickets, but they can kind of hear the roar from the stadium. Yeah. And they're watching on these big screen TVs in their the back of their truck. It's pretty amazing. And immediately once you park, you can smell the sweet smell of barbecue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a party central. I mean, it's like a party mentality there. That's amazing. I, I saw one lady selling a can of Pepsi for $10. I could believe it. So what's the least expensive seat? Because we just got gifted a couple of seats by some friends. But what's the least expensive seat, like the bleacher seat there go for? You know? The bleacher seat that I was actually in the bleacher seat. Yeah? What do you, what do you pay for something like that? $200. Wow. $200. Wow. And I believe that's because we're Tampa Bay now. Wow. You know? We wow. Tom Brady. I mean, last year, I mean, not last year, but the year before, and no disrespect, yeah. we had Famous Winston. Yeah. And I believe those bleacher seats were probably at least $50. Really? But uh, <clears throat> with Tom Brady now. Yeah, changes everything. Oh, man. He's, I mean, he's helping, you know, the hustlers, you know. I mean, like I said, the lady was trying to sell a can of Pepsi for $10. Right, right. And that's all due to Tom Brady. Right. Yeah, the parking on the lawns close to the stadium is 50 bucks. Right. Like, like it goes from 10 bucks, that's two, block, two, two miles away, to 20 bucks, that's a mile away, and then within a block of the stadium, it's like 50 bucks. And people you will see. pay it. Yep, people will pay it. It's full. It's full. And it's not like they're adding any, hey, we'll put your car in the shade or anything like that. I mean, it's sunny out. Right. You're paying full price. Full price. The birds still can drop whatever they want to drop on your car. Yeah. Fifty dollars. Right. So, but it would be a dream to actually go into the Buccaneers Stadium and play the national anthem at one of the Buccaneers games. Oh, as a saxophonist. Right. Yeah, that like some agent's got to get you that gig, right? Right. I that mean, can happen. Maybe a duo with Bill Clinton as a duo. Maybe that would be really big. And you say fair work, so. That would work. Yeah, that would work. That would be really interesting. You would, you and he would get some big applause, man. I, well, Bill might get more than me, but. Yeah, but that's a good, that's a good transition. You'd be like, handing you a saxophone. I, I don't know if he's like, he used to actually do some cameo appearances like on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, he did. Yeah, didn't he? I mean, he was kind of a fun guy. I mean. Look, you know, what other president are you going to have who's, like, cheating on his wife inside the White House? Right. That's a script. You know, it's really funny. There was a Stanford professor. He'll go nameless for the point of this story, he told me. He said, I'm voting for this guy again. I said, this was after the Monica Lewinsky uh, story broke. He said, you know, what guy do you know that 
to be on the phone dealing with a big trade issue or a big political issue. He's got a secretary under his desk servicing him while he's doing his work at his desk. Wow. The guy's like, there's a multitasker for you, man. Yeah, he is. He's, he's very capable. The guy, Stanford professor, he made a lot of a, a joke out of it. <laughs> he was like, man, there's a guy that knows how to use his time. <laughs> Pretty funny. And she's, I guess, launched a film career. She's got some film that's coming out about her side of the story. Oh, wow. Yeah, she turned into like a, a script writer and a producer. So I'm sure that Hillary Clinton is not going to be too happy with this film. Because she's going to tell the story that they were really in love and he really wanted to leave her, according to what I've read about what's coming out. That's what they all say. Right? Man. Of course. I mean... you got to say that to get yeah. that service. Right. I mean, it's uh, quite an interesting story to think about. I mean, look, Jefferson uh, had a child through some servant, right? And, you know, Thomas Jefferson was still went down as a famous president. Wasn't exactly faithful to his wife. Oh, John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy had what? Marilyn Monroe, right? She was sleeping in the White House. Right? And he apparently had a lot of back pain. Oh. Like he apparently had some really bad back condition. I mean, all these presidents have foibles. You know, they're not all supermen. Right, right. And, you know, they... Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens as women start to become president, whether they really toe the line, or whether we see a lot of foibles happen for them as well. But yeah. power goes to people's head, you know? It does. It really does. I mean, it's, it's really an interesting thing to study, what happens as people become powerful. Or famous. Or famous, yeah. That's kind of little power. Yeah, that does too. Yeah. It's a shame. Uh, I heard from uh, very great position. His name's not ringing the bell right now, but yeah. He said if you don't have Quincy Jones, he said if you don't have any kind of spiritual grounding, yeah, fame will eat you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that happened to Trump. I think he, he became famous relatively young in New York. And man, it made him bolder and bolder and bolder. And I think if his dad was still alive, I think his dad was a very quiet guy and sort of very introspective and didn't really want to get a lot of press. He just wanted to accumulate a lot of wealth. Right. But I think his dad would be like, Donald, why did you, why did you do this, man? You, you turned the family name into a cartoon character. I think that's what that's what the dad would say. The dad was just a hard-working immigrant kind of guy. You know, just amassed a fortune and then gave his son a bunch of money to get started. And that's really what enabled Donald to become successful, that original million or two that his dad staked him back in the day when a million or two was like, you know, 10 or 20 million. Wow, so Donald yeah. didn't really have No, no, he didn't. No, he went to, you know, he was kind of a truant. He didn't like going to school. His dad threw him into a military academy for all boys. And they kind of, you know, tried to beat some diligence into him. But I don't know that they were successful. And, you know, by the time it's all over, I guess we'll see how it plays out. But I don't sense that he and Melania have a great relationship. Oh, no. Right? Don't you sense that she's just biding her time, waiting to, to exit? Maybe maybe she's got to get him through the next election, get him through the next the next uh, cycle, yeah, the next campaign look, cycle. They don't look like they're very romantic. No, and she slapped his hand away that yeah. was captured on YouTube. And boy, you got to wonder what goes on in that household. Well, not too much domestic violence, but... Well, have you ever been to this place, Mauro Lago? Have you ever been anywhere near it? Apparently it's some sort of really wealthy enclave. I don't know what it's like down there. Well, I've never been. It must be very special. I've never been. I'm sure um, I want to go now, because might be some kind of... 
sponsor it out there. Yeah, you gotta be careful. I mean, he was always a big New Yorker and then New York turned against him in a big way. And now they're just pursuing him like a, you know, sort of like a dog, they're just dogging him. You know, they're trying to get him on tax evasion and nonprofit fraud and a million different violations. They're just after him in a big way. Wow, and who would have thought? Because he definitely had a lot of money. He had a lot of money, he had a lot of real estate, he had a lot of power, he had a lot of fame. Um, you know, he had a lot of a lot of things. He was kind of viewed as sort of a New York success story. You know, his dad sort of faded into the background and it became really just him. And, you know, his brother, one brother died of, like, alcoholism. Oh, wow. And then another brother was kind of like a pilot or something, just, you know, had a regular job as an American Airlines pilot or United Pilot, something like that, just wasn't very much out there. And then Donald was, like, the famous, the famous uh, youngest son who uh, really built on his dad's wealth. Mm. Quite a story. Mm. Really amazing. So, boy, you did a nice job here. I kind of feel all cleaned up. Oh, thank Feels you. Feels great. I think this is the first time I've ever had an outdoor shave and haircut. Last time I had a haircut outdoors was in Myanmar. We were traveling on a little adventure with a group. And there were a bunch of locals getting their hair cut. And I said, well, will you take me? Because I felt like I needed it. And I was like, sure. Now, where is Myanmar? Myanmar is out in Southeast Asia. It's kind of it's kind of a small country. It's been in the news lately because they've had some religious wars that have gone on oh, no. in the territory. So it's sort of like, um, I want to say it's like between Pakistan and India. And, you know, in the borders, there's always fighting that goes on between different factions. And, uh, you yeah, know, it's a very sacred place. There's a lot of monks, a lot of temples, a couple of big cities. But it's still very, you know, much, much like a hundred, like a hundred years ago. Hello. Short back and sides. Okay, okay, nice. You want a haircut? Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's an amazing country. It's got some really beautiful lakes. People are very, very friendly. Food is great really cheap to travel not to get there is expensive but once you're there you know, the hotel room might be like fifty dollars a night decent hotel room and uh, you know you can buy fish from fishermen that are fishing like there's a lot of fishing that goes on these people do it with nets and they just have a boat a couple of boats with a net that they pull out it's very much like you're going back a hundred years. It's very beautiful. Oh, nice. He's got some great pictures to show you. You'd be, you'd be amazed at her pictures that she took during that trip. I want to say we did that trip about seven years ago. That's what I want to say. I think it was 2014, like that. Plan on going back? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, right? At some point. Yeah, at some point. We have a friend that just moved from the United States to Thailand. And like he's convinced that the future is in that part of the world. Like the future is very much the development that happens through China, because China's got this big um, silk belt, silk belt road, I think they're calling it, or silk. silk Silk Belt Road or Silk Road project where they're going to do a fast train from oh, Beijing. I heard about that. Yeah, train. they're going to put some big infrastructure in to make it like to unify all these countries. 
to have where China can have a lot more influence over the rest of the world. Oh, yeah, China's got big plans. I mean, you know, they're making a lot of money. I mean, Americans buy a lot of shit from China. I mean, just like the Apple phone is manufactured in China, a lot of it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a story. Designed in the U.S., but more or less 100% manufactured in China. Wow. And so, you know, China makes a lot of money on Apple's success. And um, that money is going to be used to really exert influence over a lot of countries that are way behind. They're sort of where China was 50 years ago. You know, China was in poverty 50 years ago. And the amazing thing is if you study China, China was way ahead of the curve in the 1600s, 1700s. They invented gunpowder. They invented uh, the original uh, rifle or the original firearm. Like they invented so many things and then they sort of lost their talent for innovation. So we're gonna see China make a lot of inroads over the next 20 years over a lot of countries. In fact, there was something in the news this morning that there appears to be some skirmish between China and Taiwan over whether Taiwan needs to be reintegrated into China. That's like a big statement because there's a lot of manufacturing that goes on in Taiwan. Mm. Okay, my man, you did it again. Wow, I feel so, so new. That's so beautiful. And, you know, it's the day before my birthday, too, so Lee wanted me to look good. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. So Lee's going to pay you, I hope, because I have no money. Sounds good. I hope she does. I hope she gives you a big tip, too. I'll tell her. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great man. job. Thank you. Great job. So I'm going to... I'm going to wrap up by saying this was one of the most unique haircuts that I've received in my entire adult life. So I'm going to recommend you to everyone. Thank you. And you're going to get very busy. <laughs> and then I'm going to send you a copy of this podcast and see if you agree that we should publish it, because I think we should publish it. Let's go. And get you, get you a link so you can link it to your website and to your music. Let's go. And then get some people, additional people, to show up at the, at the uh, Hard Rock. Right. which we'll see you at. We'll buy you a drink at. We'll see it. We'll see you there. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.